Hi, I'm Jack McKissick, and welcome to Real Rock Stories on the Road. All right, we're here with Michael Wilton, Jeff Tate, and Parker Lundgren from Queensryche. Um, you guys just got off the boat for the Ship Rock Tour. How did that go? It went great. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah, it was, was, uh, fun. It was actually uh, really fun. We, we did it two years ago, and we had such a good time that we said we'd all like to do it again. And uh, so we did it this year. And I, I for one, like to do it again. Great. After this, I, I had oh, a great, great time. Great. I heard a little bit of rough seas. Uh, yeah, a few people were, uh, you know, having to put the patches behind their ears. And, yeah. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, cool. And then, so now you're, you're back. You're back on land. So you're, you're not going to get help moving around on stage tonight <laughs> without the boat moving around. You're on the uh, Dedicated to Chaos tour, um, and this is the thir like the 30th anniversary tour. Yeah. Um, how, how has this all been going? Well, this is the last show. Yeah, we're done right. after this. All right. Yeah. So it's a uh, it's been a really successful tour. We started in April, and been going really consistently all that time and uh, playing uh, playing our music for people. You know, everywhere we go. That's great. That that is great. And so, uh, are you are you delving into all of your music mm -hmm. for for the night? Are you, are you doing like because you, you've been able to do, you know, like last time I saw you was like all of Rage for Order and and all of Mind Crime. Are you are you doing that or is it just bits and pieces of a, of the whole of the whole? Well, career? we have twelve studio albums, and so we wanted to give people uh, our whole thirty year you know career in music. So we chose uh, a few songs from each record, and uh, so and made the set out of that. So uh, they'll hear uh, our evolution, really, and right. you know where we've been and where we're at now. Great, that's that's great. Um, the new the new record, dedicated to chaos, is a lot different than what you've done before, sound wise. Um, it's not a it's not a concept record, which you've done three of those. Um, what I really like about th this record is every time I listen to it, I hear something new. And there's not a lot of records that are like that, but it's but it's it can be subtle. Sometimes it's not subtle. Sometimes it is. But I think that's a really great thing that you guys were able to do with that record. Was that something that you were trying to accomplish, or is it just a happy coincidence that it happened? Well, personally, I think that all of our records are designed that way. Um, yeah, I find that all the the as far as the mixes have depth, mm -hmm. and uh, especially listening with uh, headphones, uh, you can. Uh, listen to a song one day and then listen to the next day and start hearing things that are different, yeah. you know, and that's, um, and especially with the new album, you know, that quality is, is in that as well. And, and uh, as you said, it's, uh, we're stretching our, yeah. our boundaries and, and creating. It's, and another really cool thing, the last two songs on the record especially, uh, The Lie and Big Noise, the really statements, I, uh, you know, from my, from my perspective, it's really statements on what's going on in America now. But as art imitates life, or vice versa, you can almost hear those two songs could almost fit on Operation Mindcrime. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> was it the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree? <laughs> right, right, exactly. So uh, Mindcrime was very uh, w was way ahead of its time for many more reasons, I guess. <laughs> yeah, we played that that album in its entirety, the first album, uh, the other night on the boat. Yeah, that was kind of an interesting experience because we haven't done that in quite a few years. It's, it always gets a big, uh, a big response. It does, yeah, it really does. Um, 30 years on tour, you've been all around the world. Has there been a place that you've been to, but not, when, and you just thought to yourself, you know I wanna come back here when I'm not working. Has, have you found that place where you've not been able to explore what you wanted to explore and just said, I gotta come back here? I believe there's probably numerous places. Numerous. You know, we've, we've seen a lot of really amazing parking lots. Yeah. <laughs> it's like everywhere we go, you know, sometimes, especially in Europe, we're in a different country every day. So you literally, you go to a big open field where there's a festival and it's Italy. And then the next day you wake up and it's kind of like Groundhog's Day. Now you're in another open field. Right. It looks exactly the same. You're in France. Right. And it just keeps repeating. You don't actually get to see the... Well, as the new, as the new guy in the band, have you... Uh, <clears throat> Have you thought about what you're gonna do when the tour is over? Um, start writing, you know. The, the whole band's writing right now That's on tour great. and uh, just keep it going and keep more records coming out. Very good. Yeah. Tell me about the wine business. Uh, what do you wanna know? Uh, yours, in particular. Mm -hmm. It's uh, Insania. Correct. And uh, where, do, where, do you pick, where do you get it? Well, that's, that's a bit of a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> I don't make that much. Right. Um, it's a, a real boutique wine, you know. So there's not uh, a lot of it. It's a very limited production. 
Um, we only do 2,500 cases of the red and about 1,500 of the white. So uh, it's hard to find. Uh, the best way to get it is to go to jefftate.com and hit the little button that says Insania. Right. And that takes you to the winery and a, a lovely lady named Amy will answer the phone and uh, take your order. Very nice. And send it out in the mail to you. And how, how did you get involved with, with doing that? You know, it's like everything. You just start leaning in a certain direction, and before you know it, <laughs> you know, you're, you're pretty involved. Um, I started making wine as a kid uh, when I was 14 for a merit badge in Scouts and uh, got really interested in the, the process. Wait, wine for Scouts? Yeah, yeah. It's for, a, at 14? It was a merit badge <laughs> you could get, yeah. <laughs> well, it wasn't specifically wine that okay. they were offering, but it was, you know, doing something like that, you know. And, right. uh, I just chose wine because my my yard was filled with uh, dandelions, and you could make wine out of dandelions. Oh, and, okay. And it's uh, very drinkable. Um, and I've just been interested in it since then. And uh, through traveling around the world, going to countries where they have a wine culture, I just uh, was able to sample and try a lot of different kinds of wines and found I really had a, a fascination for it and a love for it. So I started collecting wine and uh, learning a lot about it. And about six years ago, I... Uh, started doing it with uh, my partner, Holly Turner. And uh, in this spring will be our fourth release, our fourth vintage. Wow, very nice. And Michael, you've, uh, you've, you've done a solo record, or a, another band record, if I'm not mistaken. I've done, yeah, different projects. Are you uh, yeah. still working on doing stuff like that, or are you just gonna you leave know, your time I, off? I have, well? I have probably a few projects that are about 85%, yeah. you know, and then someday maybe I'll finish them all. There you go. There you go. And play a little golf when you're on your time off. It's a means for golf. That's yeah. good. <laughs> Very good. Everything, I make music for green fees. Everything, everything is a means to the golf course. <laughs> exactly. Michael's a wicked golfer. Well, I've, I've played with him. I play. I wouldn't bet him. I definitely wouldn't do that. Um, you've you've done Mind Crime in its entirety on tour. You've done Mind Crime, Mind Crime Two on its entirety on tour. You've done different albums all live. Recently, you did a cabaret. Mm -hmm. You did 12, a 12 show cabaret thing. 28 shows. You did 28 shows, really. Yeah. What, um, what, what, are the, what are those involved? Because it didn't come here. Yeah, well, it, it, we originally were just gonna do two shows. It was a one-off kind of performance thing that we, uh, we put together for uh, a show in the Seattle area for Valentine's Day. And then um, all these different promoters started calling us about it, heard about it, and wanted to book it. So we ended up doing a small tour with it, you know. Right. It was a really fun show. It was quite a bit, quite different for us. We had uh, a lot of um, performance artists that were playing with us. Um, first off, it was a story. It was, it was a show. And uh, and the performers kind of helped tell the story. And we had uh, acrobats and aerialists and dancers and uh, jugglers and clowns and all, all these different things. And uh, really entertaining show, mm -hmm. uh, all set to our music, sure. of course. That's, that's great. That's great. We have, um, we took a question from the Real Rock Stories Facebook page. Somebody wanted me to ask, there's a rumor going around, you can deny, confirm, or no comment it, that uh, there's a Rock Three Tenors record coming out with you, <laughs> Rob Halford, and Bruce Dickinson. Yeah, that's a rumor that's been circulating for about, what? 10, 15 years. Ten, oh, really? 10, 15 years. <laughs> so, Let's just uh, say you're not the first one to ask that okay, question. Okay, all right. <laughs> you get asked that too, Michael? You get asked that, that, that question? I get uh, it asked I, almost I, every interview. Really? Ask me about really? That, yeah. Wow. It, it's, it's a funny story, kind of. Um, Halford and Iron Maiden and Queensryche were all touring together right. years ago. And uh, it was a day off, and a bunch of us all went out to have dinner. And uh, it was Italian dinner, and uh, we're all sitting around telling road stories, drinking too much, and enjoying a, a really beautiful restaurant. And um, the manager for Iron Maiden, uh, Rod Smallwood, pulls the waiter over, and he says, uh, what's this music we're listening to? And it was Italian opera. Mm -hmm. And the waiter says, oh, it's, it's the three tr uh, tenors. Right. Um, and uh, Rod thought that was hilarious, and he... He stands up, well, he tries to stand up at this point. <laughs> he raises his glass and says, I think we should make a record with, uh, with Jeff and Rob and Bruce and call it The Three Trimmers. What do you think? <laughs> and we all laughed at that and thought that was hilarious. And then shortly after that, it became a question that everybody was asking us, you know, is this 
this is true. You guys are doing it right. No, no, no. It was just, it was just dinner conversation. <laughs> wow. Wow. It's one of those things. Somebody at another table heard it and said, hey, did you hear this? Did you hear this? And it's now gotten huge. Yeah. So, no. No. Okay. Is the answer. No. All right. <laughs> there we go. Um, might, be, might be a difficult question, but we'll see if we can do it. What is your favorite song to play live? We'll start with Michael. Well, for, for different reasons, probably the first song of a show be really? just because of the, uh, the excitement, the anxiety, the, uh, you know, the anticipation of how it's going to sound and how the crowd is going to react. So it's, it's in more of more of that, an emotional aspect of, of hitting the stage like that. Right. That's kind of like the most exciting part for me. I mean, I love playing, you know, right. all the songs for different reasons. Sure. So that's but, a good uh, answer. That is a, that's a great answer. Well yeah. done. Well done. <laughs> hmm. Jeff? Wow. Wish I would have thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, to riff off Michael, I'm, I would say the last song. Because <laughs> <laughs> it gets to go home. Yeah, because it's, it's time for a beer. <laughs> I, I, again, I have to agree with him. I, I like playing everything, you know, all the songs that we've done. It's a humbling experience, and I always feel very fortunate to be able to be standing up there playing our music for people, and them coming to see it, you know, and getting into it. And uh, I love every part of it, you know. I really enjoy performing. That's great. And I don't really have a favorite song. Uh, some songs of ours are incredibly challenging to sing and to play, and others of them are incredibly easy. I could do it in my sleep. You sure. Know? Uh, and so I like both aspects of that, you know, being able to, uh, you know, perform it easily and also the challenge of, of uh, tackling the, the tougher ones. You right. Know? When, when you get that done with one of the tougher ones, do you just kind of secretly just go? Yeah. Well, it depends on yeah. how it goes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a whole other uh, kettle of fish. You know, you, you never know how a song is going to come across live. Um, until you try it a few times. And one time is not enough. You have to try it several times for us to decide, okay, this is not going to work. And sometimes it doesn't work because it's in the wrong place sure. in the set. So right. you move it around and all of a sudden, oh, that's, it's, oh okay. that's where it should be. That's where it gets the best reaction. Or that's where it has the most impact. Sure. You know? And um, I'm a firm believer that if a song doesn't go over well, it's because of us, that we don't give it everything we've got or, or we're unsure of it or something is happening in the translation between performer and audience. Um, because it's our responsibility to get that song across to people. Sure. You know, it's not their responsibility to find it. It's, it's our responsibility to give it to them. Wow. Wow. Okay. You can't take first and you can't take last. So Parker, <laughs> um, I kind of, I feed a lot off, you know, whatever the crowd's into and you'd be surprised because, because a lot of people, um, they're like, Oh, this is my fi favorite song. It must be everybody's favorite song, but it's really like we get different requests, you know, every show and people say, Oh, I can't believe you played, you know, Promised Land or uh, Take Hold of the Flame or whatever. Um, so regardless of the song, whatever the crowd's reaction to is the best, that's, that's what I like, you right. know? So um, I, guessed, uh, I guess whatever your favorite song is, is our favorite song. That's a great one. <laughs> <laughs> Any go. given night, whatever the crowd's reaction is better, makes us more into it and have more fun and enjoy it, so. Very good. It's amazing how, how um, as a band, and I'm sure every band goes through this, but you want to play a song that you, as an individual, can play well, mm -hmm. you know? And that's usually the way everyone approaches it in the band is, well, I want to play the song because I really love the solo section on this, sure. you know? Or I really love the melody, how this works, and I, I get off on singing that, right. you know? Very rarely do we look at it from the bigger perspective of how does it come across live, or how, how do we individually play it? Do we, I mean, as a band, do we play it well? Right. You know? And um, Eddie, for instance, you know, he was always after us to play this one song um, off the Warning album, one of our, our first efforts. And it's a really twisted, weird little song called NM156. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it's got this part in it where it's like an audience participation, uh, obvious one, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and so, uh, we play the song, and, and uh, there's like four people in the audience that know the song. <laughs> you know, that react to it. <laughs> so I always like to bring that up to them, you know. Yeah. <laughs> have, you ever, have you ever been in the, in the studio, and you've just 
finished recording a song and going, yep, that's going to be a big one. Has yeah. that ever happened? Uh-uh. You kind of never really know. I mean, you get so involved and, and so microscopic in what you're doing. And it's, it's kind of when you, you take a break from it and you come back. Yeah. And then, you know, because I, I've done lead solos and parts that I think, damn, I just nailed it, you know? <laughs> right. Come back an hour or two and it's like, Dude, what were you thinking? Right. You know? <laughs> so it's, it's stuff, it's, I think uh, the initial, there's always an, an initial, uh, I don't know what you call it, but some little bit of magic that, that builds and, yeah. boom, you know, and it's just a matter of where it goes and then you just gotta hope that it goes in the right direction. Yeah. Know? It's like you never really know that you're successful, you know? Mm -hmm. there's, there's never a moment where you go, oh, huh, <laughs> I got it going on. Yeah. Right. You know, it just happens over time. Sure. You know, the same thing with a song. You never know that you really, you never know how other people are going to interpret what you do. Right. And, and that's, for me, that's really the beauty of art and music is that it's so subjective that people hear it so differently. You know, some people hear music as uh, they only hear the bass and they can pick out a drum beat. You right. know, and other people can follow an entire orchestral concert and tell you what parts are happening at what time and what right. instruments are playing them, you know? Everyone filters it through their own life experience. Exactly. One of the, uh, one of the, I've been going to concerts for 30 years. As long as you guys have been touring, I've been going to concerts. And I think I've seen you on every tour with the exception of the first one. One of the most unique moments that has ever happened to me and to an audience, I believe, because I looked around at a show was the last time that you guys were here at Ruth Eckerd Hall um, on the American Soldier Tour and you brought your daughter out to sing the song. Mm -hmm. There's 5,000 Queensryche rockers and not a single dry eye in the house. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was an amazing, just a totally amazing moment. It, you, obviously you guys did it every night, but did you get that feeling on stage mm -hmm. seeing that? Oh way? yeah. Because I mean that's an that's a it's an intense song anyway. But to have her voice on there, it was it, it, it there was not a dry eye in the house. It was so great. It took us about mm, probably four or five weeks of practicing that song till she and I could sing it without crying. Wow! <laughs> wow! You know, we stopped like looking at each other because right. the moment our eyes would meet, we'd yeah. start bawling. You know, yeah, it's a pretty. Uh, Pretty much a tearjerker that yeah. song. Yeah, it was it was it was a totally amazing moment. It's one of the, and, and again, in thirty years of going to shows and twenty five years of being on the radio, it's top three four moments ever. At a, I had a really couple of really cool moments as a dad. You know, with that experience, when we first started performing it, she was very new to being on stage and uh, obviously very very uh, nervous about it. And how old was she at the time? Uh, what twelve. I guess, yeah, wow. 12. Wow. And so um, she said, well, can I hold your hand while we sing it? And I said, mm -hmm. oh yeah, yeah, hold my hand and just, you know, try to relax. And if you get, you know, frightened, just look at me. And um, if you get the words, just look at me and I'll mouth you the words, you know. So we had this whole thing worked out. Right. <clears throat> After about a week on the road, she said, um, you know, I, I think I got this. I don't think I need to hold your hand anymore. Nice. <laughs> and, nice. and something inside me just, you know, it, it got me because yeah. I was thinking, oh, here's my little girl. She doesn't need to need me anymore. Right. She's, and it was really amazing. She's got a new to, career started. Yeah. Yeah. See yeah. you later, Dad. <laughs> exactly. But it was amazing to me to, to actually let go of her hand, you know, and um, watch her standing out there by herself, yeah. singing away. Not bad. And uh, watching her find herself as a performer, you know, it's, a, it's an amazing feeling. I think it was at the end of that tour, um, we were opening for uh, Chicken Foot. Okay. Uh, out in Berkeley, in California, and uh, we're she and I are standing backstage and holding her hand. We're getting ready to go out, and uh, she says, "You know, I think I want to be a singer." <laughs> <laughs> At that point, she decided, you know, but for all those few months leading up to that, when she was singing every night, she wasn't right. quite sure yet. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's funny. That's great. Well, thank you so much for doing this. This has been fantastic. Thank yeah. you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Great.